Good afternoon, both to our in-person and to our virtual audience. My name is Pearl McKaney, and I have the great pleasure of being one of the co-founders of Revival Law Southern Voices, along with Andy Rogers. This is our eighth annual Revival Law Southern Voices. We've revived more than 100 voices of various kinds at this point. And I'm very pleased with the evolution of Law Southern Voices. Uh, a couple of years ago, Andy and I were able to resign into an advisory group. And Gina Flowers and Carrie Miller, Jen Kolotosti have taken over as the directors, especially Gina Flowers, who brought in the Southern part from the very, very beginning. I wanna spend just one minute letting you know about the new logo for this. If you can see it behind me, I believe. Um, and this is a part of the new revival of Lost Southern Voices. So this is the wonderful description that they have written for this new logo. The upward motion of three circles conveys the idea of a sunrise or ever expanding revival. Revival Lost Southern Voices thrives through a collaborative effort between Georgia State University, Perimeter College, which is the Panther Blue, the Georgia Center for the Book with the purple, and the green gives a nod to our original moss-draped um, Spanish moss logo and reinforces the concept of newness and growth. It's our hope that the Revival Lost Southern Voices will continue to grow and bring revival of lost Southern voices to new readers each year. One of the other wonderful things that has happened in the last couple of years is the flexibility so that now we can have some in-person sessions, we can have some Zooming virtual sessions, and then we can combine them so that we have both people in these chairs here at the Decatur Public Library and also online from wherever they might be. Additionally, there is now a call for voices. Uh, those in the academic world are familiar with call for papers. No, we're calling for voices. Uh, and those could be artists, writers, musicians, as we're going to hear about today. And that's a, a wonderful new thing. It's not just Andy and I dreaming up like, oh, let's invite Natasha Trent away. Uh, let's cash in the one time Yusef Komunyaka was at our house, which we did, believe me. Uh, and now we still rely on many of our connections, but we've gotten some wonderful lost voices revived through this call for voices. All this happens because of Georgia State Perimeter College, certainly for the Georgia Center for the Book, which is the headed by Joe Davich and worked by Ali Stonewright, who is a, they are permanent partners now, and that we're very thankful for that. Also, the DeKalb Library Foundation and the Georgia Humanities, who have been with us forever from the beginning and hopefully all in the future, because we want to celebrate the humanities. My last job here is to introduce the moderator of our last session today. Let me get my paper. So I'm welcoming Janelle Walden Ajemma. Ajemma. I had to have that in my ear. Janelle Ajemma. She's president of Next Steps Literary Services, which I looked up earlier today. An enormous, wonderful menu of services that she can help writers with from the beginning through to the publishing. So please check that out. Next Steps Literary Services. She's played several roles in her publishing career. She's been an editor, an education program administrator, a literary agent. Soon we're gonna just recruit her to help run Southern, <laughs> Lost Southern Voices. <laughs> She's been an agent for Marie Brown Associates and worked with authors of books for children and adult readers, including Sharon Draper, Leonard Pitts and others. Presently, she oversees the Purell Miller African American Book Collection, donated by One Dozen Who Care Incorporated, a civic organization, and that is housed in the Andrews Public Library in Andrews, North Carolina. So please help me to welcome Janelle Walden-Edgeman. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is a, pri a privilege and a pleasure to introduce you to my colleague and friend, Janae Watson, who is the creator of Sankofa Serenade, remembering the words and the works of Vaude Cuny here. Janae is a writer, educator, and community engaged librarian who is originally from the Texas Gulf Coast. She is a 2023 Black Metropolis Research Consortium at the University of Chicago Fellow. In 2021, she presented the Insoroma, Insoroma, excuse me, <laughs> Bookshelf, a pop up children's library and art creation space at Elevate, Reopen, Reconnect, Reignite. Revival. <laughs> in 2016, she was a We Need Diverse Books Mentorship Program finalist. And in 2013, she was a resident writer at the Vermont Studio Center. Janae has a special interest in inspiring youth through multicultural literature and in promoting intercultural, intergenerational, interfaith dialogues. Her literary work has been published nationally and internationally, most recently in the Killens Review of Arts and Letters in fall of 2021, as well as on the Coretta Scott King Book Award blog. She is the author of The Spirit That Dreams, Conversations with Women Artists of Color, and as I may have said at the beginning, when I was still sitting down and getting ready, she's a dear friend whose passion and commitment to informing and educating everyone about her passions is wonderful. Please join me in welcoming Janae Watson. All right, so I gotta get used to using this microphone. All right, well, thank everybody. I have some scripted words here. I wanna make sure that I don't forget anything. So I wanna thank uh, the Georgia Center for the Book and Revival of uh, Four of Lost Southern Voices. I want to also thank uh, supporters and cheerleaders of this ongoing project. As uh, you'll get to hear, this is, you know, this is not um, a new endeavor. You know, so my family and friends have been hearing about this lady for a number of years, and I want to thank all of you who have taken time out of your uh, Saturday to sit here, you know, and listen to Janelle and I talk about uh, Maude Cuny Hair, someone, you know, that you, you've never heard about. So thank you. Appreciate that. All right. So, okay. Well, the big question is, who was Maude Cuny Hair? <laughs> She's obviously a Black woman, but if you're like me, you haven't heard her name come up at Black History Month when you get the, the lineup of people we hear about all the time. So, uh, she was a prodigy, really. Um, and she, uh, she was a prodigy who graduated from high school at the age of 16. Uh, but, and this was actually in Galveston. So, and I'll show you a map of, you know, some of you may be very familiar with Texas, some of you may not. Uh, but it's a coastal city, um, right? So Southern uh, Texas, uh, the Gulf Coast, and that's where she was born. But she was an ambitious, fledgling artist of color, and there was no real place for her to, you know, to grow uh, in uh, Texas. So her parents sent her to Providence, Rhode Island, and then she went on to uh, Boston. And there she studied at the uh, New England Conservatory of Music, and she also studied at um, the Lowell Institute, which is a part of Harvard University. Uh, some really interesting things happened, you know, for her there. She made many connections. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the name W.B. Du Bois, um, if you're familiar with Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. Um, these, there are just so many, there's so many people of, of prominence that she, became connected with when she was in uh, Boston. But um, while she was there, she just really honed her skills as a concert pianist, as um, historian. She was a beast of a researcher. <laughs> she was a writer. 
uh, what was she? She was um, an institution builder is what she you know, went on to do. She was a playwright, curator, lots and lots of things. Um, so it's um, all those things that I named, right? But the heart of Maude's autistic, artistic work was centered on Creole uh, music, dance, culture, uh, here in the United States. And we're going to talk a little bit uh, more about that. And so I have actually crowned Maude the Moran. Any of y'all speak? Uh, I'm not saying I'm fluent at all, but have you heard this term, either Moran or Paran? So this is a term that means godmother, Moran, or Paran is your godfather, right? So you have the godfather of soul. You have the queen of what is the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, you have the Empress of the Blues. So I'm saying that Maude um, is the Moran of our godmother of Creole music and dance as expressed here in the United States. Okay, so she was really interested also, uh, in addition to Creole music, blues, sea chanties. I know that, you know, those were, you know, popular, you know, I guess on TikTok or something <laughs> recently. Uh, and other types of folk music. Uh, she also was interested in the music of, um, if you could go to slide four. If you can envision, you can envision the Mediterranean Sea, right? You see the Iberian Peninsula, you can envision uh, Portugal and Spain and just all those Mediterranean lands. So that whole, like that, uh, is it the Mediterranean Rim? Some of you who are you know, good at geography, Northern Africa. She was interested in all of those um, musical and cultural expressions from that place because she understood how that connected to Creole culture here. If you can, a lot of the people who, let's say the Spanish and the Portuguese and the French who would go on to move into the Western Hemisphere, they were bringing with them, you know, this uh, culture that was um, kind of, you know, seeped in uh Arabian you know culture if you will so she was really interested in that too so um let's go to oh go back I'm sorry so beyond what she was actually interested in she produced so she uh was a frequent contributor to some of these magazines the musical quarterly Christian science monitor uh let's see what else do I have on here because I don't have on the glasses a uh, musical observer, and then I don't know if you're familiar with the Crisis magazine that was um, a publication of the National Association for the NAACP, right? So this was their monthly magazine. If you ever get the chance to go through those magazines, gorgeous, gorgeous, you know, just gorgeous um, uh, photography. There's artwork, you know, by a lot of prominent people. Um, and so, right, she was the music editor for the crisis at one point. So that's her literary side. And the many of the things that she contributed to these publications, the information was gathered through her travels, right? So one of the thing, one of the connections I'm going to try to get y'all to think about <laughs> or to present is her connection to Zora Neale Hurston, people like um, Catherine Dunham, I don't know if you're familiar with her. She was a, a dancer and an anthropologist. Ma was doing some of those same things that Zora Neale Hurston was doing. She was traveling throughout the Caribbean. She would collect stories, but she would also collect songs. So um, there you I'll kind of pause there because I feel like I've been talking. Let's see what's on the next slide there. Yeah, not there yet. Are you ready to tell us more about what it means to be Creole? <laughs> Okay, I did forget a couple things. So she would, okay, let me back up. So I talked about her uh, journalism work. She also wrote some um, full length books, and I brought a couple with me. This was a biography that she wrote about her father. He was a man, a uh, very, very prominent man named Norris Wright Cuny. And Cuny, I like to think of, and in many ways, I think that he could be compared to Barack Obama in the sense he wasn't operating really on a national uh, level. I think at one point he was thinking about running for Congress or something. 
but he was um, collector of customs at Galveston. That was a big deal because that's the person who, you know, controls the flow of money, you know, into uh, the state. Uh, so she wrote a full-length book uh, of her father's, North Wright Cuny, a Tribune of the Black People. Can we move on to the next one? This one I don't have. This is actually, uh, it's Message of the Treaties, and it is a tome. It is a huge collection of uh, poetry. And it's, most of the poets that she includes are not um, of African descent. There is Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and there might be one other poet of color that she includes uh, in the collection. It's not that she's trying to be exclusive or anything like that. She, she read voraciously. She read very widely. And this was um, a book that she put together, I think, as therapy. She lost her daughter. It was a very um, a traumatic and dramatic sort of situation that caused her to uh, lose her daughter. And she wrote this in tribute to uh, that daughter whose name was Vera. And the book, this one, uh, was in tribute to her father who kind of, he passed away unexpectedly also. And let's, could you advance here? This one is another book that she wrote, uh, or rather she collected um, music. Like I said, she went abroad, she listened to music, she watched dance, and she wanted to be able to share that information with people who were here in the United States and so this is the, I wish I had a version that had the really nice cover on it, but this is what I got from Amazon, right? So um, Six Creole Folk Songs is another uh, one of the uh, books that she published. There is a play, uh, people, when you read about Vaughn online, you're going to hear people mention this play called Antar of Araby. And um, she actually wrote another, at least one other play, and she wrote a pageant. Pageants were a big thing, you know, in the early 1900s. But her play, Antar of Araby, is contained in this uh, compilation, uh, Plays and Pageants in the Life of the Negro. And is there one more? Oh, and this is called her magnum opus, uh, which she actually worked on. She was working on the galleys of this book, Negro Musicians and Their Music, when she was on her deathbed, right? So she was just, she was driven. She was, I, I dare to say, almost a workaholic. Uh, so there's this, and I want to say, is there another one, Jared? No, not yet. Okay, can you go back to the... All right, so who was she? She was a musician, she was a performer, she was a traveler. Uh, she was a writer, short form and long form, and um, a builder of institutions, which we'll talk about later. Thank you. Thank you. Well, can you tell us? Thank you. Well, can you tell us a bit more about her origins? Well, okay. Am I getting it yet? A little bit. I okay. wanted to, because I want you all to know the, the significance of this woman. I wanted for us to hear a little bit from uh, some of her contemporaries and some of her friends. Would you go on and advance it, Jared? This is, you all know, W.B. Du Bois, right? So he actually lived here in Atlanta. You know, he taught at Atlanta University Center. And he and Maude were engaged. This was the love of his life. When he was 90 years old and he was writing his memoirs, he expressly said he, he they loved each other. They married other people. Uh, and I personally, I think that Maude, real, she loved him. He loved her. But I think she realized at a point that her aspirations would have to take a back seat to his if she decided to marry, you know, this man who was, a, you know, such a prominent person. But this is how I've been able to find out the majority of the information that I know about her is through combing uh, the archives, the letters that they exchange to each other. That is the richest source of archival information for her. And those letters are actually at Atlanta University. Uh, they have them there, and I think at the University of Georgia, and then they're online at uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst. So let's go back, Jared, please. This is a quote. When I met Ma Cuny, I became doubly interested. This is from his memoirs. 
when he was home. You know, she was a tall, imperious brunette with gold brown skin, brilliant eyes, and coils of black hair. She came to Boston to study music and was a skilled performer. I fell deeply in love with her and we were engaged. Right, so we already talked about that bottom piece. Could we move on? So this, because I I want to find more pictures of her. I know that they're out there. I only have a, been able to find a few. And because I know of the, you know, the the strong friendship that she and Du Bois had, I figured if I dug into this archive a little bit more, I might be able to find pictures. This picture is, um, I've seen it on numerous documentaries. I've seen it in different places. I scanned these places. I was like, there she is. So she was actually, um, she pictured with other Niagara Movement delegates in Boston, Massachusetts in 1907. So she was one of those, after they had the initial Niagara Movement meeting, I think in Canada, right? The first Niagara meeting. Falls, I think. Right. Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls. Mm -hmm. Right, so on the Canadian side. Mm -hmm. And then I think the gentleman came back, maybe it was some college, I think that was in New York somewhere, and maybe they had a second meeting. And William Monroe Trotter was one of the, uh, you know, people who helped uh, Du Bois perform the Niagara Movement. But he didn't really want to admit women, I don't think. And Du Bois was more, you know, progressive in that sense. And so you see they're like half of these delegates are women in their bodies right there. In the Niagara Movement, the Niagara Movement was a progenitor of the NAACP, right. National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Right. So can we move on? Thanks. I know this man. I didn't. Uh, so his name was uh, Alton Augustus Adams. He was um, first black U.S. Navy bandmaster. And I won't go into it because I'll end up just going on hold, you know, rabbit hole. But the two of them met and they very much admired each other in, a, you know, a platonic sense. But this was uh, what the bandmaster had to say when he visited the U.S. for the first time. He said, the crowning achievement of my whole Boston trip, his whole trip, was the privilege, the honor of meeting one of the most charming women in the person of Ms. Maude Cuny Hare. Ms. Hare, whose brilliant work, Occupy Place, in itself of American literature, came to the to express her admiration of our efforts. So let's move on. I, as you see, I forgot a little bit there, so I didn't put in, you know, what year this thing happened, but um, this is Mita Warwick Muller. Are any of you, have you heard of, um, she's a sculptor. There is a PBS documentary right now. It's a little a mini bio on uh, Mita Warwick Fuller. And if, once you get to the end of it, you see this sculpture, and this is a sculpture that Mita made of Maude. Maude was one of her best friends, and Mita is one, she's a titan of African American um, visual art. So Mita actually had, she had, she was balanced in motherhood. She had like three sons. She had a husband who was uh, supportive, but he was also kind of demanding. Uh, so it was hard for her to figure out how to work and produce as an artist and then be a mother and a wife and do, you know, all the things that she wanted to do that were expected of her. So there was that. But then at one point, her, it was a studio where she had like a whole bunch of her artwork that she produced at the beginning of her career. She studied under Rodin, for instance, right, in uh, Paris. So she got all this. Press. And back in the day, the way that we keep um, what social media profiles and we have LinkedIn profiles, people of this period, and I'm just beginning to see how prevalent this was, they kept scrapbooks. They kept scrapbooks. So many of them did. And she kept a scrapbook of like all the press that she got when she was in Paris. She was doing all this work. Her work was destroyed in a fire. And a lot of it was destroyed. And she kind of went, um, not catatonic, or she was just really in a daze. She wasn't wanting to produce anything. She didn't think that she would be able to rebound after that. 
And later in her life, when she was, she lived to be like 80, 90 years old, she uh, donated this sculpture to one of the um, libraries at Harvard. And when asked to uh, speak some words about, you know, okay, this honor that was being bestowed upon her and, you know, the fact that she was given this, uh, it was an honor being bestowed upon her. She donated this, uh, this little book to Maud. And she remembered, she said, Maud encouraged me so much to do the work that I did. She used to say, if you work only 20 minutes a day, you can do it, and it's true. And that just means so much as, um, as folks in general, but especially as mothers, you know what I mean? As, as wives, mothers, that sort of thing. And you have, you just wonder, okay, well, how am I gonna do all these things? And so these women encouraging each other and giving each other uh, strategy. You know, and, and how to continue to answer when we say God's call. What, you know, what way are you being pulled creatively? I might have one more, Jared, please. Uh, Mary Church Terrell, not sure if you're familiar with her. Uh, who can I, or hands, show of hands, who knows Mary Church Terrell? Anyone? No one. The name. Okay. It's a Black History Month icons. <laughs> yes, they are. But just the powerful, with powerful. She was the anti lynching advocate. She was a writer. She was an outspoken. Who can I compare her to? Educator as well. She was she an educator. She, her dad was um, one of the first black million. This was in the 1800s. He was a millionaire, like at wherever she was born. It might have been Tennessee. She was born in the South. Um, but she was just this very formidable woman. She spoke out against wrongs that she saw being committed. And so she was like um, the woman Bethune Cookman, uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, if you're familiar with her. So she was of that same sort of stature. So I was pleased to know that she and Maude were friends. I was like, of course. I mean, yeah. Uh, so she said, when I used to see the accomplished young Maud, as I often did, and her little daughter, and this is while Maud was going through um, just a very public and humiliating divorce, right? So she was fighting some of the battles that, you know, contemporary women are, are fighting. When I would see her and her little daughter, I could not help wondering how her first husband could have summoned the strength and courage to tear himself away from them and bid them goodbye. So... Um, I think, oh, Carter G. Woodson, I'm not going to read it. It's the Father of Black History Month, and he had some nice things to say about Maude that he put her, he says she's an amazing historian, and I want to say that that's about it. We can move on because I can talk today. <laughs> so, yes, what's next? Oh, well, we're moving on. We're moving on. I'm not even going to pay attention to Clarence Taylor. Like, <laughs> okay. Well, would you like to tell us? We see your passion, your commitment to the topic, okay. to the person. Why, Lord Cutie Hill? How did you find her? Do you want to talk about that or save it till later? Oh. That's another long story. <laughs> I want so I, because I want to be succinct, and I, I fear that I may go over time. I'm going to kind of read what I have prepared here, and I'll go off script a little bit too. Okay, so it really started with uh, Zora Neale Hurston and Catherine Dunham for me. I remember, so I was in college back in the 90s, and there was this wave of Zora mania. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but that swept through the world of Black literature. And I think uh, Valerie Boyd, mm -hmm. wasn't she? She yep. was one of the people who yep. helped mm -hmm. to kind of get this right. festival she off the ground. many times. Right. So there was Zora mania. It was everywhere. And um, I was one who was inspired by uh, Zora's fierceness and her brilliance. Um, and that coincided with me taking uh, literature of the Harlem Renaissance uh, class. So literature of the Harlem Renaissance. And then I took a Black women's literature class. So that introduced me to a whole lot of people that I didn't know. Zora Neale Hurston was one of those people. Um, so the book, still have it, this wonderful copy of Their Eyes of Watching God you know, with illustrations by uh, Jerry Pinkney. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous book, you know. So this was my introduction to Zora. And then I was spent a lot of time at bookstores. I just, um, and 
One of the bookstores that I would visit was the Shrine of the Black Madonna in uh, Houston. And Shrine of the Black Madonna is an art gallery, bookstore. They have, you know, event space. And anytime I would get money, I would take the number, whatever it was, 66 bus down Old Spanish Trail and write, look, this is one of the books that caught my eye. This is Catherine Dunham. And Catherine Dunham is there. And it's Dances with Haiti, right? So this had to come home uh, with me. And how many have seen Alvin Ailey's Revelations? So just, you know, first time I saw that, I you just, you you can't, you're nearly in, in tears. It's like your heart is beating fast. You know, there's goose pimples. It's, it's a whole spiritual um, experience. And so, right, actually, right. So there's Judith. And then Carmen de la Vlad. I don't know if you're familiar with Carmen de la Vlad and her husband, Jeffrey Holder. Look them up. There's a whole film. It's called Carmen and Jeffrey. He's from Trinidad. She is uh, from California. Uh, from, anyway, she's got Creole roots, Louisiana Creole roots, but I think it's from California. All of this together made it so that when I, um, what is it, right? So I tell you about all these discoveries because there is a tie-in. Um, so the, my introduction to these people happened in Texas. But interestingly enough, my introduction to Maude and her work didn't happen in Texas, which is my birthplace. And that of my maternal line going all the way back to the 1870s. I'm like a fourth or fifth generation Texan. Um, instead, my introduction to this woman, who was born in the same place that I was born in, Galveston, Texas, uh, but like maybe 100 years before, it happened here in Atlanta, here <laughs> in Atlanta. So I was living in uh, Virginia Highlands. There was a bookstore. Again, if I get money, I'm in the bookstore. <laughs> so... Um, I was hunting for a completely different book. Ben Okri, he's a you know Nigerian author, The Famished Rose. I didn't find that, but instead I found the book uh, that Maude wrote about her father, Norris Wright Cuny, Tribune of the Black People. Brian is sitting out. I'm like, what is this doing here? It's a book about a Texas politician, a black Texas politician here. What is it doing here? So I took that as my cue to take it home. And from there, it was just, I was like, okay, Written by his daughter, with his daughter. Got the name, did another Google search, and then found out her archive is here in Atlanta. Why is it here in Atlanta? A friend of mine said, it's because you're here and you're supposed to tell the story. Right, and you're supposed to tell the story. Right. <laughs> so there you go. Um, so as far as what is uh, interesting to me about her is she was really clear in her mission, laser focused. Okay, she was um, very inspiring. She, uh, I'm a teacher as well, so she was one who kind of stood at that crossroads, and she would bring information forward from the ancestors to pass it on uh, to the youth. So she was very much a teacher, but she did her teaching through um, art. I want you to tie up something. You introduced all the dancers, the researchers, our mm -hmm. uh, anthropologists tied in directly to Maude because you're making a statement about legacy there. Mm -hmm. But you started at the end and are working back to her. Right. So what do, okay, do we want to talk about pre-law thing? Do you want, do you want a timeline or what do we um, just recap? Just recap, because you gave us all the people, but you didn't say, oh, this is why. They all share in common. I got some. We're going to do three old things. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, three old. That, um, again, I might be reading because I want to be succinct, but um, I think I want to, because if we talk about her parents a little bit, that's going to tie into the whole, uh, the Creole piece. So let's, I'll just 
kind of do it. A, a lot of us are confused about what it means to heal. Okay. Because I thought it was just folks who were of a certain skin tone out of Louisiana for a long time. What's and a Creole? So Anybody? You have any idea? Are you Creole? Any Creoles out there? French. 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 Yes. French. Okay. Caribbean. 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 Oh. Oh. New Orleans. That's what you, okay. Any others? Not a seasoning. <laughs> but the main question I would say for y'all is what would y'all say defines a Creole? I actually want to hear answers on this oh, one. So speak. You're off mic. <laughs> So mixture of languages. Mixture of languages. I've heard that. Race. 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 Yeah. African. European. Uh, Indian. Yeah. So, Janelle, this is a good opportunity for us to. So, your thought about uh, Creole was when you would see the word, what would you think? Well, I told you, I didn't know. Totally ignorant. And I thought for many years, and you have informed me, uh, enlarged my understanding that it was a person of mixed ancestry. Um, and because of the environment I was living in, I thought they all had skin color like me or lighter. Uh, and many were out of out of uh, Louisiana and somehow had that background of French ancestry. Mm -hmm. From speaking to you about this project, it's much larger than that. I now know. Right. So we're gonna have, yeah, we're gonna approach yeah. this not, you know, it's not gonna be compact, but we'll let's jump in. Okay, so what is a Creole? And I'm not claiming to be a complete <laughs> expert, but Louisiana Creole culture, how we hear people kind of lump the two together, um, is distinct from Cajun culture. I don't know if you kind of are aware of that. So when we say Cajun is like, um, what do you call it? You break the word, you take a portion of it, right? So it's, um, think Acadian. Right, so Acadian is Acadian. Those, and I'm not sure of all the history that's connected to it, but I think that these were people who were pushed further south, like from Canada. They were primarily Caucasian, and they landed in Louisiana. So Acadians are this one group. When you think the Creoles, they tended to come from further south. We're talking about this global south now. So people from you know, the Caribbean, Mexico, every place that you read about, like, let's say there are in Mexico, in Belize, and throughout the Caribbean, even down in Brazil, the word Creole, their version of it, is actually an epithet referring to people who are Black. You know, so Creole is, and people, it's a hotly content people still to this day. Some people want to go to blows about what exactly, you know, constitutes Creole. But um, Southern Louisiana is the capital, I would say, but not the only point in, in the Creole world. I grew up in this, it, it, it's, it's Texas, but it's the Gulf Coast. Creole, you find, you know, places like Mobile, Louisiana, and, you know, just Southern, it, it's part of, you know, the South. And it could be argued, you know, that um, it's a different type, but uh, Georgia Sea Islands, you know, those uh, those barrier on that same type of Creole, but like you were saying, it's a blend. Um, so Southern Louisiana is a point, but it's not the only place. That Creole culture is not confined to, as we were just talking about, just the US. It is not a color, okay? So um, and that I wanted to say, go back to, I got from somebody's Facebook page. I don't want anybody to be looking and thinking I'm stealing their stuff. So New Orleans Creole Story Pot, this came from uh, their place. So, and I think that this also, it's a it's an internal thing. It's very much internal. For Creole people, faith and family is everything, everything. And not that that's not true for other people, but they, family and faith are everything. So it's like I said, this intersection of the, you know, five Fs, faith and family, food, you know, they did to a, a, you know, fine, you know, art, you know, it's their food. Fun, the joie de vivre, all about fun. And uh, many times, 
very gifted and skilled in very fine arts. And then often there is that uh, French piece, not always, you know, but some people might just speak English. There are different types of Creole. There are Spanish, you know, people might speak Spanish, might speak Dutch, you know, down in Caribbean. So um, we can move on. And this is what Maude has to say. Uh, this is Costa paintings. This, you know, these come from uh, Mexico, right? The different types of relationships between folks. In the Southwest of North America, uh, Louisiana and Texas in particular, Creoles are descendants of the original French or Spanish settlers and the women of the land of whatever blood, right? So some people will say, well, you can't be black and be a Creole. You can't, you gotta be pure white. It's, it, it doesn't, it's just, it, it's not, it's not skin color exactly. It's more something, it kind of has to do with mixture, but it's almost, what's really important is it's that, it's almost like the coming together of like colonists and indigenous, you know, folks, because you can even have Alaskan Creole, it's not, it's, it's not the same, but it's that coming together of those, you know, those two groups. Can we um, see what's on the next slide? Sure. And the reason that I ask you the question again is because so much of Maude's work is focused upon the Creole experience as expressed through the dance and, and the music in particular. And she was first and foremost a, a consummate music musician, yes. performer, as well as a, a writer. Yes. Transcriptionist, uh, she historian, musicologist, she did it all. Mm -hmm. So that's why I asked the question. <laughs> and because it's the heart of her work. It really is the heart. She did a lot of other things, but she would often speak of all heart Creole, you know, very, you know, um, owning their feelings. You know, this is her word, not that it's true, you know, just. Um, to be able to live and live well, have that joie de vie, you have to feel. You know, you can't be kind of sleepwalking through life. Um, so I get just as I like visuals. And so this whole um, really these are white dots, which you can't see in this lighting. And that, oh, that's a Creole post, <laughs> you know, right there. And I circled Galveston just, you know, in case some of you aren't really familiar with where. Uh, that is, and so you have, it's not all that far from, uh, you know, points in southern, uh, you know, Louisiana, and then you see just all of this is really, uh, and I think I might have even, it's, hold on, let me find, because I want to really um, be sure that I mention a couple of things about, yeah, we're running out. Okay, so um, some scholars speak of Galveston as I grew up experiencing it as part of the Creole Coast. And scholars like there's a woman named Susan Wiley Hardwick and Terry Jordan Bishkov who have used it to describe a distinct and yet undefined geographic region of the United States that is closely linked to the adjacent West Indian world in terms of foodways, landscapes, uh, coastal festivals, all that sort of stuff. So let's just go on and quickly go through, Jared, if you would move on. I was talking about that connection between, um, you know, Andalusia, Iberian Peninsula, you know, France, all that, and how that connects to Creole culture. She was very much interested in that. Can we move forward, honey? Um, just, yeah, wonderful uh, image. She would have loved it. Move forward, honey, please. Uh, so, um, so this is her dad. We'll quickly go to this. Her dad's dad was, some people look at him and say, oh, well, this is not a black man. He's not, but he's, he's of African descent. He's multiracial is what he was. He was born enslaved. He was one of eight children born to um, a plantation owner who came from that little place circled, Rapides Parish. And uh, his name was Philip Cuny. So Philip decided to, at a point, leave Louisiana, it's a whole story in and of itself. And I really believe this is that he traveled along this El Camino Real. This is a road that goes all the way from Louisiana, goes straight down to Mexico, right? Even to this day, it's still there, goes to Mexico City. And so 
uh, Phil Cutie traveled on that road and landed at a uh, little bit of land that he called Sunnyside, which is on the Brazos River in Texas. Some of his kids were born in Louisiana. Some of them were born in Texas. This one, uh, Mark's dad, was born in Texas. So he carried that Southern Louisiana culture with him. Okay, can we move on real quick? We can move on. Um, he was a Mason. This is super important uh, to uh, the sorts of, um, you know, the, the, the visual types of, um, what would you say? Traditions that Maud would have been exposed to. Let's move on, babe. This is Maud's mother, uh, a quadroon of French extraction. Her name was Adelina. She was born, you can't really see this, but this is a border between Louisiana and Southern uh, Mississippi. So this is where her mother was born, Woodville. And her dad was another uh, plantation owner and who moved his family down to uh, Galveston. So let's, um, we can move on. And for those of you who aren't familiar with what Galveston looks like, there are no plantations in Galveston, <laughs> right? So it's more town, uh, you know, town type slavery that existed there. And that's where the Emancipation Proclamation was um, also signed. So real quick, let's move on, Jared. These are the sorts of things that Ma would have seen uh, growing up, these are Juneteenth uh, uh, carriages, right? So people, there's Mardi Gras, there's things like this, you know, that are, uh, you know, part of her growing up and her imagination, and that I believe uh, fed the sorts of um, writing, you know, that she would do uh, later. Let's go on and move quick. Let's move to the next slide. This is actually in Brazil. I see some uh, visual, the connection between this is a, when I say it, it's Black Brazilian, but this is a Creole culture as, as well. So all the pageantry and, you know, that sort of thing. Let's move on. Mardi Gras in New Orleans. This is an old, um, got this from Rosenberg Library of Mardi Gras, um, an invitation to a ball. Okay. So moving on. I mean, you want to get Let's get right, the, the music, music. But, but also with all of the pageantry, we don't want to forget that she she authored plays, mm -hmm. and was constantly performing or engaging other people to perform in her productions. Yeah. yeah. So we're seeing how it all where it all came from, right? <laughs> where it all started. And yeah. So this is uh, one of the songs that uh, she would perform. So let let me see what else is there. I wanted you to see because I guess we're. Uh, so she talked about how uh, she was a musician, but she recognized that there's this constant interplay between music and dance. You can't have one without the other. She wasn't a dancer, but she would hire this woman. Her name was Mildred Davenport. And as far as I can tell, Mildred Davenport was like the Debbie Allen of her time. Just really, really good at what uh, she did. Ma would frequently um hire her to you know interpret uh certain uh dances and that is i have this i'm not the only one there's one tara hunter she did a lot of uh she did a wonderful uh introduction to this reissue of north right cuny tribune of the black people and she's a modern you know a, a scholar who did just again wonderful biographical uh, work and i think she saw a connection between the work that Maude was doing and that of Catherine Dunham and, you know, whatnot. But when I think of, I know that Maude influenced the work of Zora and Catherine, you know, and I think of the things that she was exposed to as, you know, a kid. I'm not saying that she was alone, but I know that she had an impact. You know, she wasn't a dancer, but she would hire dancers. I think that somebody like Catherine Dunham saw this and probably was, you know, inspired and maybe took it further. You know, same for Zora. There are some times when there was like, you can see that Zora and Ma were kind of crossing paths in a way, you know, so. Um, crossing paths because of where they went? Because they of Du Bois. Oh, yes. And L.A. La. Okay. Yeah. The intellectual yeah. leaders of the era. So this is some press uh, from... Uh, so this is from Syria. A lot of the press that Ma got was from the Black press. Um, not all of it, but a lot of it. So, you know, you see that 
So Boston Herald is talking about a presentation of Haitian music that she's going to uh, give. Uh, this one is from the Syracuse Herald, where it mentions that she's going to, uh, she would do costume recitals. So she didn't really just sit at the piano and play. She would uh, dress up in theatrical attire and she would uh, tell stories. And then she would illustrate her stories with music. So it's almost like, you ever listened to Jazz Night in America? Have you ever listened to that on uh, NPR? <laughs> or, right, it's on WCLK. It, so it's a program where it, it, it's almost like a, a musical documentary. So she would talk, she would tell a story, and then she would uh, be dressed, you know, theatrically, and then she would play music. And so, uh, yeah, this is a piece that she wrote on um, Creole music in Virgin Islands. Let's move along. Okay, let's move on. I want to get to the dance. So, do we want to do the dance? Let's not do the dance, but let's move to her music. No, please go forward. This is uh, Children in Mexico. This is work that she did. Uh, where she would write, you know, about the history of, you know, the literature and whatnot. Move along, please. A uh, program where it talks some of the places uh, that are in this Creole world, Mexico, there's Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Jamaica, and she lands in uh, the United States, Louisiana. She's drawing a connection between all of these places. Let's move along, please. Let's quickly go through these and let's just get to, this is one of her uh, theatrical uh, productions at uh, Arts Academy that she built in Boston, right? So she did a lot of work with the community and she was very much concerned about the development and well-being of young people and children. Let's move along. Another um, scene, this is from, I wanna make sure to say, Kathy A. Perkins Theater Collection. Allow me to use these images. Move forward, baby, please. Okay, so let's, uh, so this is some songs from her repertoire. Let's move, forward. let's hear, go forward, I think. I wonder if anybody has, whether it's online or whether it's people who are here in person, any comments or questions? I actually have a question. Um, what, what would you say is the difference between Creole music and Cajun music? Okay. It, it, oh, okay. <laughs> I know, I really. If you can you're seeing the question, please, for oh. our online audience. She asked, what is the difference? What is the difference between Creole music and Cajun music? Right, I'm not an ethnomusical, I'm a music lover, but as far as like the specific differences, I can't necessarily answer that because you see, I don't know if you were paying attention to the fact that whether I even included them, um, that there are so many examples that when we think Cajun, we think uh, fiddles, you know, we think stringed instruments. And you hear and you see a lot of those same things in uh, the Creole music of the Caribbean, as well as, you know, there's not a whole, what I would probably say is maybe um, drums might not, you know, be so much a part of the Cajun and Creole might be more likely to use, you know, more percussion. That is what, when I'm just quickly thinking through it, that's what I would guess would be the primary uh, difference. Okay, and one obvious question is, one obvious question is, we're here at the uh, revival of lost Southern voices. Why is it, do you think, that we don't know about more in general, the way we do Mary McLeod Bethune or, or any of the other, Zora Neale Hurst and so many other performers, artists amongst us? I don't think uh, she was able to be fit in a category, like a neat category. People like to be able to place people kind of um, in a box or put an easy label on them. If we could, you could quickly go to slide number one and just remember her face, quickly uh, escape, and then just all the way up to number that first one. So when people see a face like this, you know, like, um, what is it? Uh, Mary Church Terrell said a lot of people they would look at her and they would assume that 
some pictures you look at her and you think she's East Indian or you think that, you know, she could be from France or people would sometimes think that she's from Spain. And people like to be able to place folks in boxes and categories. And she doesn't really neatly fit into a category. Uh, she, she, as far as she was concerned, if she had to pick, I'm a black woman. Okay, that's how this country works, I'm black. You know, cause those are my, you know, I'm not gonna deny my, the full range of my ancestors. And so she doesn't fit neatly into any of those categories. And then also in terms of the work that she did, she was, her, her talents were broad, mm -hmm. you know, that, one of the reasons I think she's not just a writer, not just a dancer. That's my guess. But she very much what? She very much was a Southern woman. And do you have a concluding remark? Because we're at the time. <laughs> I just, I want to, yeah, I really want to thank all. I'm, I, it's just a pleasure to see uh, friends uh, who, um, you know, who <laughs> decided to come, you know, who I talked, you know, I, I talked into coming, let's say, you know, <laughs> some friends who are supporters, people who have never heard of this woman before and who, you know, took an hour, hour and a half or, you know, two out of your time to, you know, sit with me and, you know, let me tell you uh, stories about, you know, this this uh, historical figure who is uh, dear to me. So I thank everybody. That's my final uh, closing response. And I echo that. And the people who are in <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting Janae Watson and me to share some information with you about a most wonderful uh, artist, Southern artist, Maud Kinney. Yeah. Now we know the name. Yeah. Go find some of her. <laughs>